Hello, everyone. I'm Eric Strong from Strong Medicine. Today, instead of a relatively didactic, purely medical topic, I'm going to tell a story. But not just any story. This is one of the most beautifully bizarre, unbelievable local town fiascos that I've ever heard of. It's got everything from police corruption, child sex abuse allegations, bumbling local reporters, million-dollar lawsuits, rare medical diagnoses, Reddit, Med Twitter, and, to a small extent, yours truly. This is the story of how r slash medicine is sending a woman to prison. Two big disclaimers up front. First, although I'll be discussing some legal issues, I am not a lawyer. So if I use the wrong legal term at some point, please don't skewer me. And second, anyone accused of a crime is presumed innocent until proven guilty, even in cases in which their guilt seems overwhelmingly apparent. Our tale begins in January 2022 in Aurora, Colorado, a city of nearly 400,000 that lies just to the east of Denver and which sits mostly within Arapahoe County. At the time, there were ongoing concerns among the city's community leaders about their local police department and its leadership. One of these leaders was newly elected city councilwoman Danielle Jarinski. On January 27th, she was an invited guest on the local Stefan Tubbs talk radio show, where a lot of ground was covered on this issue and others. But there was one particularly notable moment when Jarinski talked about the then police chief, Vanessa Wilson. If you want to quote something, Chief Vanessa Wilson is trash. Wow. Uh, okay. Um, hold on a minute. I got to get a drink of water. <laughs> Take, drink some water, Stefan. Get ready. Get wow. ready. Um, this is you... my hometown we're talking about. And, and those who, who threaten to destroy it or do harm to Aurora, just know that I'm here. <laughs> I'm here. The following day, Arapahoe County Child Protective Services received an anonymous call stating that Jarinski had been sexually abusing her own two-year-old son. A subsequent investigation was launched, which determined the accusation was without merit. And this is where the story starts to get interesting. That false accusation, it triggered a criminal investigation of the anonymous caller, who was determined to be a woman named Robin Nasida. Uh, Nasida was, uh, happened to be the intimate partner of Police Chief Wilson, the so-called trash. Nasida was also an employee of the same Child Protective Services office that she herself had called into using her own cell phone. Nasida was arrested in May 2022 and charged with a felony count of retaliation against an elected official and a misdemeanor charge related to her duties as a social services worker. In the meantime, Chief Wilson had already been fired by the city manager based on concerns about her overall leadership. Councilwoman Jarinski, who had never met Nysita previously, felt that there was something seriously wrong with this woman for her to take such an action and called for a review of all of Nysita's child protective cases during her employment with the county, fearing that Nysita may have been weaponizing the office for personal gain. This review identified dozens of mothers who had been investigated by the county who allegedly received unwanted sexual advances from Nysida, who then threatened to have their children removed from their homes when these women rejected Nysida. Once again, allegedly, some of these mothers did indeed have their children removed due to Nysida's intervention. While Nysida was awaiting her criminal trial, multiple lawsuits were filed, including one by Jarinsky against Nysida for slander, libel, and quote-unquote outrageous conduct, Nysida mounted no significant defense, and she did not even show up to her court dates, resulting in the judge making a default judgment against her for $3 million in January 2023. There's an ongoing class action lawsuit on behalf of approximately 40 individuals who claim Nysida tried to inappropriately take away their children. Another ongoing lawsuit was filed by one of Nysida's ex-girlfriends, Kristen Nichols, against ex-chief Wilson and the city of Aurora, claiming that Wilson abused her power to have Nichols arrested in 2021 for domestic abuse against Nysida, charges which were subsequently dropped. However, before they were dropped, these charges reportedly resulted in Nichols losing her job as a nurse, 
and having her own six-year-old daughter temporarily being taken away by a county district court to be raised by Nicida, as Nicida had helped raise the girl by Nicida and Nichols were a couple. Nicida was even investigated as being the source of a phony bomb threat made against her office around the same time period. At this point, if you're thinking that this is an ugly, sordid, unbelievably, absolutely insane mess, I completely agree. And yet, this is where the story takes an even more bizarre turn, and we'll see why I'm talking about it on this medical-themed channel. On March 30th of this year, during a hearing concerning Nicita's criminal charges, Nicita's lawyers unexpectedly informed the court that she was now incompetent to stand trial because of a newly diagnosed brain tumor, specifically a dangerous and aggressive type of tumor known as a glioblastoma. Although every patient is different, the median survival for patients diagnosed with a glioblastoma is a little less than a year. Nicita appeared virtually at the hearing that day, and she was incapable of speaking or responding to questions. Immediately after the hearing, Councilman Jarinsky expressed skepticism of the diagnosis, telling a reporter, I have a lot of questions and I have a lot of concerns. I think this is completely made up. Nevertheless, Nicita's lawyers provided medical records to the court, including images taken from her brain MRI. There was no indication that the prosecution offered any objection to this development or an objection to a request to delay the trial due to the brain tumor diagnosis. At this point, it looked like the case might end up indefinitely delayed, with charges possibly dropped altogether since it appeared unlikely Nicita would ever again regain competency. Although at the time, her lawyers only formally argued that the tumor made her incompetent to stand trial, this development also raised an interesting question as to whether a brain tumor could be responsible for Nicita's behavior. The grand total of what Nicita has been accused of is not run-of-the-mill run vindictiveness. It's sociopathic. Could this be the tumor? There is a well-described phenomenon in which brain tumors can cause personality changes and increased aggression. The most famous example of this is a man named Charles Whitman. Whitman was a sharpshooter in the U.S. Marines, one of the nation's youngest ever Eagle Scouts, and a well-respected engineering student at the University of Texas at Austin. Until, at the age of 25, seemingly out of the blue, he developed headaches and, in his own words, overwhelming violent impulses. Several months later, in August 1966, he assembled a small arsenal and ascended to the 28th floor observation deck of a tower at his university, from which he shot 46 people, killing 15 of them, before he himself was killed by police. Whitman was concerned enough that he had a medical reason for his homicidal actions that his suicide note included the line, After my death, I wish that an autopsy would be performed on me to see if there is any visible physical disorder. An autopsy was indeed performed, which found a small brain tumor adjacent to the amygdala, a structure which helps regulate memory and emotion. The amygdala is the primary source of the so-called fight-or-flight response. Although Whitman's tumor was not large, it's been speculated that it may have been physically compressing his amygdala to the point that it was no longer functioning normally, thus triggering his uncontrollable, violent impulses. Is it possible that Nicita's actions could be attributed to her brain tumor? While changed personality and increased physical aggression from brain tumors are well-described phenomena, Nicita's actions, they don't really fall into the same category. She's been accused of lying, manipulative, antisocial behavior, not abrupt mood swings or physical violence. At the same time, the brain is profoundly complex, and our understanding of it is still relatively rudimentary. On the whole, although I was not yet familiar with this case at this point, I would have said that it's plausible, but I also have not been able to identify any similar case reports in the medical literature. Returning to the legal proceedings, the judge in the case determined that there was insufficient information to make a preliminary finding of incompetency, and he ordered Nicita to be evaluated by CMHIP, or Colorado Mental Health Institute at Pueblo, 
which is the state's largest public psychiatric institution. In response, one of Nasida's lawyers emailed CMHIP to state that Nasida could not travel due to her diagnosis of glioblastoma, her cognitive function is at a minimum, and she has significant mobility issues and her doctors do not recommend travel for her. As suggested at a subsequent hearing, which I'll get to in a few minutes, the prosecution appeared to buy this story, and this might have been the end of it. With all charges dropped, Nysita quickly, re uh, quietly receiving her oncologic care, and the world never hearing from her or about her again. But instead, for reasons which I still don't understand, Nysita's mother provided a local news station, CBS News Colorado, 16 pages of her medical records, and images from her daughter's brain MRI. Based on these records, CBS Colorado, led by investigative reporter Brian Moss, yes, that's really his name, ran an update to the story on April 29th of this year and included these images of a glioblastoma sitting in Robin Nicita's brain. And Brian, you talked to Nicetta and her family. In that interview, Nicetta really didn't say much. But these medical records provided to CBS Colorado from her family seem to support what came out in court last month, that Naseda appears to have a cancerous brain tumor that may make her unfit to stand trial. We showed these MRI images and medical records to Jarinsky, who wasn't having any of it. There's no authentic signatures. There's no, nothing's notarized. So looking at these medical records does not convince you that she has a brain tumor and is incapacitated? No, no, I'm not convinced. There's zero chance that I believe anything that comes from her. In the midst of sitting with her mother during a recent Zoom interview, Naseda was unresponsive, appearing to be in a stupor. At one point she gave a slight wave, but that was it. You know, I wish people would think or maybe do a little bit of research first before they decide to open their mouth. This is what is going on right now. And there is nothing made up. Jarinsky said she was unconvinced, adding, quote, I want justice. If she's not lying on her deathbed, let's go to court. I want justice more than I want her dead. By now, you might have already guessed where the story is heading. These images of Robin Nicita's MRI are photoshopped. It's understandably not apparent to laypersons. It wasn't apparent to the prosecutors or judge or to CBS Colorado's investigative reporting team. But it was apparent to a presumably local physician who saw the story and who subsequently posted it to the Medicine subreddit where over 50 medical professionals discussed the inconsistencies in the scan and to some extent mocked CBS Colorado's coverage. This is when I first heard about this whole thing. Why did those of us on r slash medicine think the brain MRI was fake? There are several major indicators. First, the tumor appears to move. In the coronal image, the tumor's location, shown here in blue, is relatively lateral, located in the temporal lobe, where it coincidentally would be compressing her amygdala. But in the sagittal views, the location shown in red is in the midline and a little higher. Second, on the sagittal views, despite them being different slices of her brain, the tumor appears remarkably similar or even identical. Third, and for me this was the clincher, there is no distortion of the surrounding brain tissue. Most symptoms of a brain tumor aren't caused by the cancer itself, Instead, they're caused by the tumor compressing normal structures and triggering adjacent edema and inflammation, as speculated to have been the case in Charles Whitman's mass shooting. For example, in this MRI, which is not Nicetas, we see not only the tumor mass, but also all the surrounding tissue is clearly very different than the other side of the brain. In a normal brain, this would be symmetric. With Nicetas' scan, her tumor appears to be copied from another image, and paste it on top of a macroscopically normal brain. In addition, there are a few more subtle signs that this is a bad Photoshop job, which I am deliberately not going to point out because I don't want to provide too specific a roadmap to the public of how to fake medical images. So, armed with this information, several folks from r slash medicine, including myself, 
reached out on Twitter to the reporter, Moss, yes, once again, Brian Moss, to let him know that he had been duped into showing a bogus scan as if it were real, and to not so subtly point out that an investigative reporter should have actually investigated the story before reporting it. You might expect that when multiple doctors independently reached out to him, he would think, oh, maybe there's something more to this. I guess I should show these to a local radiologist and see what they think. But no, he doubles down by taking our concerns back to Nicida's mom and then adds this note to the story. A follow-up to the story to clarify these MRI images and why they appear the way they do. The medical professional who oversaw the administration of the MRI told the family of Robin Nicida that some public confusion may have arisen because Nicida has two tumors in her brain, not one. One is on the temporal lobe, the other midline. So, it's true that multiple tumors can be present at the same time, but while the temporal lobe tumor might not be directly visible on the sagittal views, the midline tumor would almost certainly be visible on the coronal view. It goes on. The explanation given to the family is that images are initially produced in digital form, but are then essentially screenshotted and copied onto a document that is sent to patients and their families. This would be really unusual to do, but I sort of can imagine it. During that process, certain portions of the MRI are removed or blurred to avoid confusion for people not familiar with MRIs. I cannot imagine that. The claim is that a radiologist is manually editing an MRI image. Radiologists do not do that. That actually feels like a potentially fireable offense. They also removed some of the necrosis dead cells around the tumors to help show the size and scope of the tumors. So not only do radiologists not do this, it's not even possible. MRI images are not like, are not like Photoshop documents with multiple layers in which you can just click off a checkbox and the necrosis layer is hidden. Plus, removing something like adjacent necrosis would make the tumor look smaller, less impressive, and less dangerous than it really was. In short, this explanation posted to CBS Colorado in response to criticism from multiple doctors of the original story is itself total bullshit. So Moss got hoodwinked not once, but twice by a woman who had already been exposed as a serial liar and manipulator. The local news reporter, he isn't the focus of this whole saga, but I don't understand how he could so completely screw this up. I actually subsequently had multiple people spontaneously reach out to me from the local community and news media in Colorado about this, and a consistent theme was that Moss is usually a great reporter, and they, they were astonished in this particular case. As frustrating as this minor chapter in the story was, I honestly hope the guy is okay. At this point, my mild amusement over the absurdity of photoshopping an MRI scan to avoid a criminal trial transitioned into anger. Not only might this truly awful woman avoid prison for a heinous crime or potentially a series of crimes, she was invoking a horrible fatal disease to do so, a disease that I've had patients die from, and that was not remotely okay. I felt compelled to prove beyond doubt that the image was fake. It occurred to me that anyone willing to submit a Photoshop to a news station would also probably be incompetent enough to use a brain tumor image from a public database. And after a few minutes of searching, I found the coronal tumor image was copy and pasted from a case posted to radiopedia.org in 2010, and the sagittal tumor image was copy and pasted from an image posted to Wikimedia Commons in 2012. I posted a thread about it on Twitter, tagging both Jarinsky and CBS Colorado, the latter of which did not acknowledge it. But that also didn't feel like enough, so I sent a brief email to the lead prosecutor, pointing him to the Twitter thread, and within a few days, the presiding judge was aware as well. On May 15th, Robin Nicida returned to court, where she was now miraculously able to walk and talk normally again. She brought a new attorney because her previous ones understandably requested to withdraw from the case due to irreconcilable conflict, while her new lawyer stated that she indeed had competency to proceed with the trial. 
The prosecution stated that he had spoken to a Dr. Marquez, who was implied to be the oncologist from Nicida's medical records, and the prosecutor admitted that at the time, he was not thinking that the person on the phone was just pretending to be a doctor. However, subsequently, presumably after the fake MRI came to light, the prosecutor was unable to confirm that a Dr. Marquez even existed. The phone number for Nicida's oncology clinic was a cell number, and its website was created on GoDaddy just a few months prior. In court, the judge stated that they were gravely concerned about the veracity of a number of the statements that were made in the defense's motion seeking incompetency. As I said at the beginning, I am not a lawyer, but this feels like legal speak for your story is bullshit. Nicida's trial is now scheduled to start in August, and additional charges related to fabricating evidence are almost certainly forthcoming and may add years to her all but certain prison sentence. Although she so far pled not guilty to the previously indicted crimes against Jarinsky, I cannot imagine a remotely plausible defense for the fabrication of evidence. And this doesn't even touch the accusations that she separated mothers from their children in retaliation for having her sexual advances rejected, which to my knowledge have not yet led to any indictments. In the end, a post to r slash medicine by anonymous user Reddit Ask Jeeves was a key step for an alleged sociopath to meet justice. Hopefully. As a fitting epilogue, when CBS Colorado covered the more recent development that Nicida's brain tumor story was made up, they spun it as if they had a positive contribution. And get this, they said that it wasn't until after our story aired just a few weeks ago showing some of Nicita's medical records that they started to look into the legitimacy of her medical records, saying that our story prompted many concerned citizens to reach out to prosecutors, saying they were concerned that some of her records may have been fabricated. Yeah, I suppose CBS Colorado's coverage was the catalyst for the scam to be unraveled, but only because that coverage was so, so bad. Notably, they have not acknowledged their error, nor have they publicly apologized to Councilwoman Jerinsky for not sufficiently considering her well-founded skepticism of the whole thing and for portraying her as inappropriately harsh to a person who was claiming to be terminally ill. And last, true to apparent form, when referring to an unnamed doctor from Stanford, the journalist could not even correctly spell the university's name. This fiasco raises so many questions. How can a person be cunning and manipulative enough to fool so many people, yet be so dumb as to release a photoshopped MRI scan to a news program to be shown to the public? But also, how do seemingly intelligent people just blindly accept medical records indicating a lack of capacity when those records have been provided by a person with such a track record of dishonesty? The prosecution should have immediately vetted those records with a medical professional, one whose existence they were actually certain of, or the records should have been obtained directly from the hospitals. Why did the prosecution not at least proactively confirm the doctors in the records existed? What do I hope comes out of this? For one, I hope that justice and accountability find Robin Nicida. Second, that any families who are harmed by Nasida, including Ms. Nichols, receive appropriate compensation from the city of Aurora and Arapahoe County. Third, that Ms. Jarinsky receives at least a fraction of the $3 million she's owed from her defamation lawsuit. Sure, the docs on Reddit helped to push this story along, but Jarinsky, she's been steadfastly fighting this in court and in the press for a year and a half now. And unless Nicita throws in her cards and pleads guilty to everything, this fiasco could easily drag on and on and on. Fourth, that justice also finds anyone else who helped to facilitate this scam. For example, the person who pretended to be Nicita's oncologist on the phone. To me, it seems unlikely Nicita's immediate family were not aware of what was going on. And given that her mother was the one who provided the records to CBS Colorado, that suggests they were active participants. Now, that's not an accusation, but rather a hypothesis that the district attorney should really be looking into. 
And my last hope is that there is some reform concerning how courts handle the medical records of defendants. Prior to this, I would not have imagined that a defendant claiming incompetence to stand trial would not have had their records examined with a fine-toothed comb by both investigators and consulting medical professionals, or require those records to be obtained directly from the relevant medical offices and hospitals. It literally took a non-radiologist, non-neurosurgeon, only minutes to conclude that Nicida's brain tumor story was fake. And yet, had the story not been posted to Reddit, it's possible that Nicida would have gone free. Now, for what it's worth, the judge does not seem to have been as gullible as a prosecutor, Nicida's prior lawyers, or the news media. After reviewing some of the court documents and transcripts, I think the judge and court would probably have caught this scam eventually without our assistance. But the system should still not have allowed Nicida to come remotely close to getting away with this. As the judge said himself, it could have led to a dismissal of this case if I had found incompetency. I did not grant that, but that was the tone and tenor of where this was going. This saga is ongoing and currently unresolved. I'll post about it again when there's a major update. I know that I was a little critical of some folks in this video. I should point out that in court, the prosecutor has acknowledged his error in being too trusting of the medical records, and in another pretrial hearing last week, he successfully argued a number of points for the state regarding submissible evidence. He believes the case against Nasida is so strong that he has reportedly rejected the possibility of a plea deal. Councilwoman Jarinsky had another appearance on the Stefan Tubbs radio show in which she indicated she has been more recently pleased with the course of proceedings. And I'd also like to give a quick shout out to Johnny Turnage, a sergeant with the Arapahoe County Sheriff's Department, who has been working this case for over a year and has had to negotiate local politics and investigating one of their own. I'm sure he is also looking forward to a resolution on this. In the meantime, while you're waiting for an update, if you are new to the channel, you should know that this is not representative of my usual content, which is typically educational material for healthcare professionals. However, a portion of it is geared towards a general audience. I hope you check out what else is here. And if you have any thoughts on the Nasida case, feel free to comment below. There's zero chance that I believe anything that comes from her.